1903, the Wright brothers made history when they achieved the first controlled flight in human history. Just 58 years later, Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human being to reach space. Then, a mere eight years later, astronaut Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin became the first humans to touch the moon. In the current generation of space technology, rockets are the fundamental vehicle for space travel. For decades now, we are still using chemical propulsion to lift our rockets into space. Many scientists agree that we need a more powerful propulsion method to deliver our rockets for future space travel. While chemical propulsion continues to be refined and optimized throughout the decades, scientists believe that nuclear energy should be the next step towards better rockets, particularly nuclear fusion. So, you want to know about nuclear fusion? Well, here are some of the fundamentals. There are two types of nuclear energy. One is nuclear fission, where atoms are split and releasing huge amounts of energy. And the other type is nuclear fusion, where atoms are bound together, creating even greater energy compared to fission. Fission is a very powerful form of energy production. It produces about one third of the world's carbon-free energy. Using the fission reaction, it heats water into steam to turn turbines. Thus, the only emission from a nuclear power plant is simply steam. But there is one key detriment to nuclear fission, that being radiation. With every nuclear power plant, there is nuclear waste. And nuclear waste, unfortunately, is not just something that you can throw in a landfill and forget about it. Radiation can persist for decades, maybe even hundreds of years. Other than the fact that nuclear fusion binds atoms together instead of splitting them apart, it is a safer and more powerful source. How so? Fusion requires some conditions in order to happen. It requires intense heat. Fusion fuel has to be heated to millions of degrees, similar to the core of our sun and many other stars. And this is the exact type of energy that stars around the universe are powered by. Nuclear fusion also requires intense pressure. The core of our sun is not only millions of degrees hot, it is also thousands of times more atmospheric pressure than what we have on Earth. Because of these conditions, nuclear fusion differs from fission by being a source of energy that needs to be achieved and maintained. You have to heat fusion fuel and give it enough pressure in order for the reaction to even happen. It's not like nuclear fission where you can put two radioactive materials by each other and have it go out of control. Why do we want this source of energy for our rockets? Well, in a fusion reaction, just one kilogram of fusion fuel produces as much energy as burning 10,000 tons of coal. What that means for our rockets is that we do not have to put as much fuel on our ships. If we can efficiently convert fusion energy into usable energy, a small manned spacecraft will only need a couple hundred pounds of fuel, whereas modern rockets carry on thousands and millions of pounds. Another benefit of fusion energy is that it is very abundant. The most popular choice for fusion fuel is these isotopes of hydrogen called deuterium and tritium. These two variations of hydrogen sounds like something that might take a lot of effort to obtain, but the truth is deuterium could be extracted from water and tritium, while requiring some manufacturing, can be produced with relative ease. Additionally, other candidates for fusion fuel, such as helium, can be found on the moon. Solar ejections have deposited up to millions of pounds of usable helium on the lunar surface. So that brings up an important question. Why aren't we using this energy in our rockets? The simple answer is that we have yet to sustain a fusion reaction to where it produces a net positive of energy. There has been two important breakthroughs from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, but in both instances, we were not able to harvest the surplus energy produced from the break-even reaction. But that did not deter scientists 
from trying to implement nuclear fusion into rocket ships. Friedward Winterberg, in his 2010 paper titled Deuterium Microbomb Rocket Propulsion, proposed of using small deuterium fusion bombs to propel rockets. Mathematically, this proposal has very little flaws. The use of microbomb explosions does provide enough energy to lift a rocket into space and have it explore nearby planets. But the problem is, they are using literal atomic bombs. Turns out detonating literal atomic bombs may not be the safest way to deliver a rocket into space. Evidently, we are not going to be using nuclear bombs to propel our rocket ships. Well then, what developments have we made? Many scientists have taken their jabs at creating a fusion-powered spacecraft. There is the Pulse Z-Pinch, Hyper, Fusion Fission Hybrids, Electro-Ionic Propulsion, and the list goes on and on. And if that's the case, why haven't we heard anything about it? There's only a handful of places in the world where you can even conduct fusion research. Additionally, more volatile methods like the microbomb explosions or the fission-fusion hybrids, which produces radiation, receives backlash from governments and the general public. Not to mention the lack of political interest in space exploration. That compounded with how expensive fusion is. If you don't have a well-thought-out blueprint, governments will be very reluctant to fund any development. Recent yet significant paper published by Michael Paluzic and his team of researchers proposed a fusion-powered Titan spacecraft. Now, the actual name of the spacecraft is still tentative, so from here on out, we'll call it the Titan spacecraft. In their paper, they not only proposed, but also confirmed that they will be developing a spacecraft that will be powered by only nuclear fusion. With help from Princeton satellite systems and using a powerful direct fusion drive, they concluded that the Titan spacecraft can reach Titan, Saturn's moon in the outer solar system, in little over two and a half years. Two and a half years sounds like a lot of time, but compared to previous spacecrafts launched by NASA, which took nearly six to seven years, two and a half years is shortening the travel time by more than half. The success of the spacecraft means that we can explore Titan, a moon that's been fabled to possibly hold extraterrestrial life. Even if they can't find extraterrestrial life on Titan, the moon is still a very promising candidate for human settlement and further research. So why is space exploration important anyways? What benefits do humanity get? At an economic standpoint, space tourism is a highly anticipated field. Successfully implementing fusion into our rockets means cheaper travels to space, allowing space to be more accessible to the general public. If we look at the long term, highly anticipated fields like astro mining can provide Earth with valuable metals that can help develop our technology even further. And of course, interplanetary settlement, one of the most exciting prospects of space exploration, whether or not that is a good thing for humanity, we really can't know until it happens. But perfecting our space vehicles will certainly decrease the likelihood of any complications. And in the end, maybe that cliche statement is true. We just want to know how far we can go into space. Well, for us to get that answer, we're going to need nuclear fusion. Thank you for watching.